Dear friends, glad to meet you all. It is 10 minutes past 10, Tuesday, July 19th on Fagin Live. We're doing another stream with uh, Alexei Ristovich. Sorry, we had a bit of a technical delay here. YouTube uh, had some issues with getting us live. Anyway, we're back up again. Good evening, Alexei. Good evening. We have about 200,000 watching us, almost 50,000 left their likes. Please uh, share the links to this cast. Sorry about the delay, you know, equipment breaks. So we'll talk about equipment today as well. Let's start maybe with the map. We have the usual overview of events, what happened in the last 24 hours of 146th day. They shelled the uh, Sumska region, they shelled uh, Chernigov and Kharkov regions from the northern side. Um, no movement really, uh, just shelling. They also tried to push from Izum to Slavyansk, that area. You can see the red arrows um, didn't quite work for them, so they used artillery. From Verkhnikavinka they're trying to push to Siversk on the right. So, they are trying to get to the intersection of two roads, Bakhmut Pakrovsk and Bakhmut Svetlodarsk, um, and they want to control this road. Our uh, command acknowledged that they did push a little further and uh, got to almost to that road intersection. So Siversk is not captured yet. Uh, oh no, they, it's still a long ways to go to Siversk. All their brave uh, statements is basically information support to lift up their falling pants from their own troops and uh, try to pull our pants down. But it's not really working. Facts do not support that. Um, near Avdiivka, they're trying to make some motion. No success. Zaporozhye, no changes. Kherson, uh, it's a star of our evening cast. We actually hit the Antonov Bridge. Tell us more. Uh, was it Heimars or was it something else? On the picture I've seen, there are some holes in it. And it's hard to tell. Uh, is it Heimars or is it something else? I don't know. Could be Heimars, could be Himars, could be something else. Um, so I saw those holes in the bridge. Is I thought Heimars shells leave bigger traces. Um, it depends. It depends upon the bridge, the construction of it. So concrete, uh, you know, that they might have, if it is built well. Um, this is not exactly the most important part. The most important is that the position of air defense was destroyed, that was based next to the bridge. And also the garrison that was protecting it and their headquarters was destroyed. We also shot the bridge itself, but it is, you know, not expected to destroy it completely like tomorrow. So is there a task to destroy it fully? I am sorry, Mark, I am not the general command. I don't have exact um, knowledge of that task. I don't think so. I am observing what they're doing, and I think they there was not the main goal to destroy it. So, Today there was some interaction between the Air Force and our anti-air defense actually shot down Su-35, who was trying to chase our planes and uh, it fell down, burning, and uh, there are a lot of videos of it going down. I still want to go back to Antonov Bridge. It's on uh, 5, okay, now on 6 p.m. across the river. I'm thinking it's probably an experimental targeting. I think that's how they treat it in the Russian command. Oh, yeah, they also uh, boldly stated that they shot down several missiles. You mean HIMARS? Yeah, I sincerely 
do not believe them. And frankly, the task of destruction of a bridge of that type using MLRS systems is a non-trivial task, but, um, you know, our troops have been showing success in achieving non-trivial tasks. So, if there will be a task uh, posed in front of uh, Ukraine military, I think they'll have enough forces to at least make it not exactly usable. Perhaps they won't even destroy it, but it might be very unusable after. And that'll be half the end for them, because there are only two bridges across the river. Um, Nova Kachovka, the one around 3 p.m. on this map, and Antonov Bridge, the one at 7 or 8 p.m. If they lose both bridges, then the whole right side group that they have across the river becomes really sad and starts to wither. So, and the one we talked about today was uh, the one that uh, automobile and uh, food traffic bridge, but there is also a railroad bridge. And uh, railroad bridge, when the train is going on it, it's really hard to miss. So. It tells me we just haven't targeted yet. So I'm thinking Russian command is probably scratching their heads. They are probably already gone through the scalp and it's pretty bloody. Because they can't really find a way to defend it. It's not really hanging by a thread, but the trend is very uncomfortable for them. Regarding the supply problems that we're about to create. So prognosis is uh, prognosis is very unfavorable for them. All right, let's before going to political topics, let's uh, take a look at weapons supply to Ukraine. I've seen uh, six Caesar machines mentioned in the news. How significant is that in? Uh, comparison with other supplies and can you consider that to be part of that uh, preparation to fulfill the order of their of your command to deoccupy the south well the thing is everything uh, supplied even one machine gun can be considered uh, as the accumulation of tools before the operation. Um, of course, we will be freeing our territories, but it's hard to tell, or I'm not ready yet to tell, where uh, that will start from. I perhaps am thinking that it'll be a surprise. And one of the rules of war is do not make obvious steps. So I think that's, you know, how it works. We talk about it every day. We're discussing it. They in Russia really very often take it for serious. Um, they link to my channel, they link to you. They don't link to me directly in words because uh, they have to mention every time that I'm a foreign agent according to their stupid laws. But factually, they do mention it. We're like provocateurs, uh, foreign agents and terrorists. Uh, stirring this stuff up for them and give them a reason to be nervous or perhaps make some public statement or action that we can discuss next day all right let me say something so they get little a little more active you guys are gonna get your ass handled to you regardless of the direction that we choose north east south because uh, 12 Caesars have been uh, brushing you pretty well. And now we have another six more coming. Caesar is one of the best counter battery uh, equipment. Why? It's quick. It drives on the wheels, it gets there, shoots at the detected target, and leaves. And also, do not forget, we have. Uh, uh, Gepard's, uh, it's an anti-air tank, very interesting machine. 
that provides protection for our troops. And all these things together, they hang over Russian troops with a very deadly, deadly cloud, dark cloud over their heads. And eventually that shadow will fall on the area where they decided to uh, hold referendum and see if they can adjoin it to Mother Russia. Uh, by the way, yeah, we also have uh, infantry returning back from Britain that is uh, being trained. You still have an illusion on the Russian side that you might take Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, but these illusions will uh, turn into some really bloody crocodile tears. So, if you want to, you can still grind your troops in uh, stupid attacks onto our defense lines. And we're waiting for the moment when your command will say, all right, we cannot do go any longer. And that's when uh, we'll come for you. We've been 11 minutes live. We have 320,000 watching us. Let's discuss uh, Putin's Iran trip. Um, you know, every time he leaves uh, Russian Federation, I think first time he flew to Ashgabat and Dushanbe, and now he flew to Iran, uh, he met uh, with the Russi uh, president and Erdogan was there as well, from Turkey. That was preceded by a conversation about uh, UAVs. Then there was a statement that nobody will give them and then there was a statement from Putin that uh, we didn't even ask. So, a few questions. How do you think any Iranian UAVs, if they even exist, the whole phrase Iranian UAVs sounds kind of weird. Um, I wonder if there is anything in Dushanbe or some other place. How much uh, meaning do you think all this hassle has? I understand they're tr trying to find some weapons, but... Uh, do you think that's indeed just looking for UAVs? I think he's just looking for UAVs. That's probably what it is. And he's not being given. Well, maybe they will. The thing is, uh, they have very codependent relations. Russia, in essence, is a competitor of Iran in the Middle East. And Iran has some UAVs. They attacked some of the ships. And uh, they also attacked the... Uh, airport in Saudi Arabia, the military, and they attacked some of the oil rigs. So Iran, um, unlike Putin's Russia, actually managed to create some production capacity, some for UAVs, some for airplanes and tanks, even some space satellite stuff. And they've been under sanctions for 40 years, so they technically can supply some of the UAVs to Putin's regime, uh, which they like and uh, scream about that in all their public forums and boards, saying how much they effed up the subject of uh, drones and UAVs to a degree that Putin had to go himself and beg for that um, the president of a huge country with a huge industrial and resource potential leaves it to try to beg for uavs that are being manufactured somewhere in the village because that is the chains of the same link his uh, directors his officials are reporting to him that uh, the capabilities of the artillery, which used to be their key for any advancement they have had before, because HIMARS are destroying all the possible logistics for the artillery. It's the first thing. Second, anti-artillery radars are effective. So anti-artillery, counter-artillery uh, fighting is going on successfully. So if you want to keep any artillery success on the front, dear Putin, you have to go and ask one of your allies uh, and they looked around and found Iran. Remember how it all started in uh, February 23rd 
will turn Ukraine into ashes and Putin will ride on a white horse in there and join the remnants of the country to the, Rus to the Russian territory. Um, the owner of the world, restorer of the empire, and now he's going to visit Iran to beg for UAVs for the Russian army. Not necessarily successful yet, just trying to beg for it. And uh, also train his citizens in Moscow to run to bomb shelters at the first sounds of a siren. So let's talk about uh, UAVs, Russian UAVs. Do they present anything, uh, those Orlans and other models they had? So the problem of Orlans is that there are too many of them. Russian army has a ton of them, but they and they have a ton of they have a ton of them really. So even if we destroy one, they have another. They have a ton of it. Um, however, Orlan is the brigade level weapon. It's not a small platoon detachment or something. And it's not exactly a too effective weapon because we started doing ours about eight years ago. They started doing building theirs much uh, shorter before the war. What's important is that that cluster of uh, equipment, Russian military machine and science, has completely forgotten about. And now they're trying to catch up with it different ways. They had some success in uh, using Israel's help to build their own UAV after the war in Georgia. And unfortunately for them, we did destroy most of these. And um, the other weapon that they can use is Orlan, which is basically a brigade level. And it's not a problem for us. We have a lot of these, our own UAVs, um, we can use them anywhere, and they're basically trying to catch up, because every UAV turns uh, artillery battery into a small strike complex, and without it there is a huge list, a huge uh, loop that needs one needs to cover for artillery duels, for effective targeting, so they start to understand that without uh, that uh, link, it is really impossible or difficult to win counter-artillery duels. So before uh, HIMARS, they were launching about 45-65 thousand shells a day, and now it still needs to be verified, but at least it's about 15 to 20 thousand, which is basically a third of what it used to be before. So before they were just leveling everything in front of the army and moving in. And now a third is definitely a much weaker uh, alternative. And that's what they tried to move but failed. Their intel was uh, captured and disarmed and destroyed. So every motion, every attempt to capture something does cost them significantly more uh, without that uh, massive artillery support. So they had some ideas for uh, winning before. Right now, this is nearly impossible. And when uh, artillery basically are telling them, we, we're not sure that we can support your offensive right now, and perspectives are even weaker. So they start scratching their heads, and their president goes asking for UAVs. It basically should not be presidential level going after these uh, pieces of equipment, but if it is a uh, first topic of his visit, and even though there are other uh, points to the conversation with, uh, you know, Turkey um, or zones of interest of Israel, etc., um, one can only imagine the level of problems that other uh, the Russian army has, and by the way, the the other fun th stuff is uh, President Erdogan because his country is supplying ours our uh, UAVs. His uh, son-in-law Bayraktar was on the other press conference a couple of days ago, and he did say bluntly, "Don't even hope, Russians, you won't get anything." So it does look like. Uh, 
Biden's visit also added something to that situation. Putin really wants to be somewhat similar to Erdogan, uh, but Erdogan is more effective in his politics. He usually comes with uh, very well prepared asks and topics of the visit. They're defending their interests, they're uh, trading for uh, certain uh, values, certain uh, material resources and uh, other things. And it's very well thought out, very concrete. What does Putin come for? In uh, many cases, it just appears that it is ideological visit or general support for something. What else a good political leader would achieve? Certain concrete results from a trip. I do not remember anything like that from Putin's visits. And maybe, perhaps, you know, some negotiations somewhere he will achieve uh, success. Do you think they'll, they'll achieve success? Well, maybe. I don't know details, but imagine if they do. How will he explain that to the internal market? We wasted 50,000 soldiers for cancelling it later negotiations. And did you see his pictures recently? He's an old decrepit man yeah right they'll be uh, claiming that he was training his uh, limpness and uh, weird issues uh, for us to just discuss or foreign foreign press to discuss him but it's all fake right um, I think it's uh, you, one can see there's definitely a Cushing syndrome there's some issues with his back because he walks in a semi-squatting manner, he's a very old-looking man who became older much quicker than people expected him to. And the war that was supposed to be a culmination of his uh, rule became effectively the main point of his uh, fall. So I can only imagine what is uh, he feeling inside. Uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich, if you're listening to our cast, just, uh, you know, think about the uh, other world, think about the future. Repent. Just a good action of repenting may change what happens to you in afterlife. So, you can also advise him, Alexei, I can uh, be his priest and you can uh, lead his uh, burial service. We should probably make a merge in this regard. All right. Um, Liz Truss, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Britain, is leading in the Conservative Party's list. Things seem to be falling in good direction there, and she seems to be very feisty. Um, she's good in terms that she's uh, laying out new political vision, and she's concrete about it, and people... Uh, People are some inspired, some curious, but one should understand British model is very different from Russian. In Russia, there are ideas, there are no ideas. Here are 22 years, you got to just endure the same ruler. In Britain, there is uh, definitely a market of ideas that they compete in. And at the same time, each of the candidates did declare that Regardless of uh, who wins, we all support that issue and uh, Ukraine should not even worry about it. Um, I've seen even some betting agencies uh, accepting bets for her win and uh, people are definitely leaning towards her victory, so far at least. I don't know exactly what her opponents are suggesting, but she offers an interesting picture. And Britain has one group of issues, they don't have much resources. But as for the vision uh, that she offers, it's a very robust vision. They do have, however, a will and a understanding of the different complexities of world situations. I did uh, have a chance to deal with some of the Intel people from Britain and they are very advanced. Um, they can rather easily discuss on the captain level 
of this agency some archetypes of 400 year old um, history so education um, level of culture is on a very high level there on average um, in my experience and it's interesting how uh, they play of course they do provide a strong support to us they are definitely a pillar including uh, it's them it's Poland and several other countries all right another subject on the sanctions we got 55 more people that we saw some messages that Mashkov and Bezrukov Russian actors they supposedly will be in those uh, sanction lists. What you might call them? They won't be able to travel further than Donetsk theater. So for the artist, it's a sort of a, an order, I guess, in Russia, when they can uh, come and uh, smile and say to each other, "Hey, I've been sanctioned by the West." Do you know the joke about the comic and the tragic actors? So, yeah, well, comic uh, is sitting in the bar, tragic comes in, and the comic is crying, yeah, they don't invite me, it's been a year, they've forgotten about me. And tragic is also drinking with him, and I'm not being invited either, they still remember. So, what do you think about the Ukraine movements in the government? Yeah, I heard somebody got punished. Let me check. I'll need to verify the names. It was cursory in my attention span today. So, could you also check the list of uh, sanctions with the president while you're at it? because we do need to make sure we got the propagandists from Russia, some of those Russian uh, pedophiles, uh, propagandists who live in Spain, talking about some concrete people. It's not just about us, though. It's also about the West. I think Commission McFoley or Mark already is at about 50% milestone. However, one needs to understand that uh, working with a private um, property is not so easy for the West because uh, in many cases one needs very high level parliamentary procedures to achieve that but it just takes time um, they'll get there it, it might take longer so some people were saying oh there are no energy uh, there are no fuels in the seventh uh, set of sanctions so some people in Russia were happy. Oh, there is no, they don't. Uh, they're not part of that. One should read it that they try to expedite the seventh, and there is also a room for that in the eighth, which is also in discussion. Um, by the way, gold is part of sanctions. That's another a couple dozen um, billion dollars a year. Um, a third of the military budget, that's, uh, that's a good sanction. We do understand that Western decisions, they do come, they do take time. They do come through, but it's definitely a slower process. And one needs to understand the scale of events to come kind of keep the eye on a wider perspective. We also hope that the West will stop being too reflective on certain personalities and will just throw a wider net and grab uh, all those that are actively propagandizing and supporting that war. Especially after all the vignettes and other horrors of this uh, Russian war in Ukraine. I personally think one sh one politi politicians should not be holding themselves. Anyway, um, we got about four hundred thousand people watching us. We have another cast tomorrow on Wednesday, right? Yes, we do. Okay, so tomorrow we'll talk about everything we did not talk about today, and we have a next question about cadre rotation after 
the retirement of uh, Ukraine security service, uh, safety service, um, and also the office of attorney general. So today parliament voted on three top figures and yes, uh, president signed signed their retirement orders, big change in security service in Ukraine is of Ukraine is coming. They're promoting people who have been very successful back in the 2014 and uh, the first part of that war. So the task is to refresh that service and make sure that it is acting better in its full capacity to the benefit of Ukraine. Because that service was weakened somewhat even before 2014, um, a mix of different factors. So the task is to make it more serious, more battle-worthy, so to say, and uh, the goal is to bring good regional leaders to it, and uh, that's what we're focusing on right now. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left. Let's look at our charity program. Here's a bit of new items, new design. You can order these online. T-shirts are available and they're available in all the stores. I like the one on the right. Fear nothing. Uh, Mark, I cannot see that. I can only hear you. So I need to trust you what you're saying. But I do support your opinion on this. It's very minimalistic design. And another one with our two good mugs and sunglasses. Mark, can I uh, speak about something that bothers me? When we win, will you invite me to Kremlin? I, I don't know about Kremlin, if it'll be there, but of course I'll invite you. Have you been to Kremlin before? Yes, I've been there several times. When I was a um, congressman, I've been there and I also visited one advisor to Yeltsin. It was early on in uh, 2000. I already ha start to have, you know, as we discuss here, some deja vus and flashback as we're walking near the Kremlin wall. And one can hear the bells in the distance. And we were talking about something good in the future. So that's a good future, you know. I want to keep that in the, in our focus. I just want to say, by the way, the offices there are rather modest. I've been at uh, Dichenko's and the Gaitsev's offices. On the other hand, I would like to come to the scene of the Union House and uh, have a cup of coffee and a discussion with the group. By the way, another idea. Once you're there, Mark, we should bury Lenin right away. Don't keep the corpse in the living room. I wouldn't even put him in the ground. I would just put him in, crema in uh, crematorium. And I usually trust my intuitions, but recently I actually did start to have interesting flashbacks about walking with you, meeting you in Moscow and talking about some interesting subjects. Um, please write them down as you see these visions, so we might as well check how true they are. And we also want to bring them up on our show, because right now they're, there is a very nervous uh, situation in Moscow. By the way, did you hear if Patrushev got poisoned or not? Um, we need checking on that. I do not trust the rumors, but there is definitely some motion happening especially with uh, with their children and there are a lot of unknowns and interesting groups of influence once we have more data about uh, more finite data about putin's health and some plans of his uh, immediate vicinity groups of power so whenever you 
In order, those who studied logic, you know, you need some more data to be logical. Uh, Alexei remembers a song from a classic 1950s, 60s movie back. Uh, so yeah, at this point when uh, there is a famous criminal handcuffed to the wheel of his vehicle, I can lean in and uh, sing him a song about Kremlin. I'll join you, I'll join you. Um, anyway, um, please buy our merchandise, help us do the charity, subscribe to both channels, subscribe to the private station if you have not done that yet, and talk to you tomorrow.